The next talk is by uh, Tal Dvir of uh, Tel Aviv University, and uh, Tal is also bioengineering. So, uh, about engineers, and while he is dealing with his computer, so, uh, by the way, compu ap uh, apropos computers, so do you know uh, what is the proof that they had uh, computers at the time of Moses? Because Moses, uh, the Ten Commandments, he downloaded it from the cloud, right? <laughs> and then when it broke, he had a backup that he could download it from, okay? Uh, but since he's from biomedical engineering, so you know there is a story that a group of um, um, in, uh, engineering professors had to go uh, to a conference abroad. So all the plane was filled, it was a special plane, and it was filled just with professors of engineering. So the steward comes uh, up and says, you know, because you are all professors of engineering that are flying to this conference, uh, we prepared a surprise for you. The plane that you are going to fly with was all planned and built by your students. Well, you can imagine the commotion. People are run, trying to run out of the plane through the doors, through the windows, any way they can. Only one professor, Tal, is sitting down and uh, still playing with, uh, his computer. So they tell him, you are not afraid? He said, no, I'm not worried. Said, Why not? He says, well, I know these students. Uh, they ran a, uh, a project in my lab. No worry, the plane is not going to take off. <laughs> so, on this happy note, I can uh, uh, let Tal uh, talk, and he is going to tell you about personal in engineering personalized tissue implants for regenerative medicine. Thank you, Yoav. And uh, thank you, Mira, uh, very much for uh, organizing this uh, important meeting and for inviting me. And uh, as you all know, uh, as we all age, uh, different organs stop working properly. And in my lab, we're uh, trying to engineer these organs to uh, be uh, more functional. And we're working on different types of uh, organs. We're working on the heart, on the brain, spinal cord, intestine, uh, eyes. But I uh, chose to focus today on the heart. And uh, before telling you about the technologies that we can uh, develop in the lab, that we developed in the lab, I'll say a few words about the disease. So uh, heart disease are still the number one cause of death in the Western world, more than all types of uh, cancers together. And uh, myocardial infarction or heart attack captures a significant fracture of these diseases. And it happens when a major blood vessel that nourishes the left ventricle is blocked, and as a consequence, blood, oxygen, nutrients are not arriving to this area. Cardiomyocytes, the cardiac muscle cells, are very sensitive. They don't get oxygen. They simply die. And this whole area becomes fibrotic, becomes a, uh, a scar tissue, cannot contract, cannot send pulses of blood to the rest of the body. And the poor statistic says that 50% of the people who've had their first heart attack, severe heart attack, will die within five years. Um, currently, the only solution for the end-stage patient is heart transplantation, and since we all know that there is a shortage in donors, there is a need to find new approaches to repopulate this area with cells that are capable of contraction. Now, if we just take cells and inject to this area or any other place in the body, most of them, more than 95% of the cells simply die, so we need to uh, create a tissue before we uh, introduce this uh, area and this is what we do in tissue engineering and how do we do it uh, we can take uh, cells uh, preferably from the patient we culture them initially in uh, flask or uh, petri dishes and then we need to create a tissue and tissues in the body are not just cells they are the cells and the extra cell matrix uh, which is very important and in the lab we develop different types of biomaterials that mimic this extra cell matrix um, it needs to be uh, three-dimensional and porous. Uh, uh, we can add different types of growth factors or uh, systems that can slowly release uh, growth factors, small molecules, nanoparticles. And essentially, we're doing anything we can to allow the cells uh, to assemble into a functioning tissue, which we can then take 
and transplant on the defected organ. So how do we create the cardiac patches? We can use different types of uh, cells. Usually in the lab, uh, we're using uh, induced pluripotent stem cells that are taken from uh, patients, uh, um, and then we reprogram them to become induced pluripotent stem cells. We manipulate them, we see them in uh, scaffolds, and then we've already shown that uh, we can regenerate the infarcted heart. This is by uh, echocardiography uh, and uh, electrophysiology. However, there are different challenges that uh, still remain, and one of them is how to create a biomaterial that really mimic the extracellular matrix of the heart. And for that, what we've done, we've uh, taken uh, pig's hearts, removed all the cells while preserving all the uh, ECM proteins, and uh, what we can see here is one big mess of uh, fibers. We can see microfibers, we can see nanofibers, uh, aligned fibers, uh, randomly oriented fibers. And initially in the lab, we wanted to uh, evaluate what's the role of the different fiber populations. So synthetically, we created these micro or nanofibers, aligned or uh, randomly oriented fibers. And just to give you a couple of examples, when we culture cardiac cells on the uh, aligned fibers, the cells are aligned and they, are, uh, they form an anisotropic uh, tissue. When we culture them on the uh, randomly oriented fibers, we get uh, no uh, anisotropy. And this is extremely important because this tissue propagates the electrical signal and uh, we, uh, we want it to uh, contract uh, nicely. Another thing is the effect of uh, fiber diameter. We have the nanofiber, one micrometer fibers or five. And usually these days, if you put the word nano in a grant application or in a, a paper, you increase the chances of acceptance at least in 50%, right? But the cells, uh, well, um, so the cells don't really like the nano, uh, the nanofibers. Uh, they prefer the bigger fibers. And when you take everything into consideration, the morphology of the uh, fibers, the mechanical properties, which I haven't shown, the biochemical content, you can create nice scaffolds that once you cut your cardiac cells, uh, this is a few centimeters in diameter, the patches contract nicely in the lab for a long period of time without external uh, stimulation. However, these uh, patches are two, three millimeters in size, and if we want to engineer something which is more relevant for uh, patients, for humans, we need something thicker, and when we go to uh, thicker scaffolds, we have mass transfer uh, limitations, oxygen cannot penetrate. So uh, what we've done next, we developed a way, and I'm not going uh, into all the details, but to culture layers of uh, uh, muscle, muscle cells, cardiac muscle cells, and uh, layers of endothelial cells that form uh, blood vessels and uh, uh, put uh, uh, VEGF particles that slowly release uh, uh, the factor for vascularization and another layer of uh, dexamethasone particles to uh, uh, avoid the rejection. And when we, uh, we culture these uh, layers separately and just before uh, transplantation, we assemble it and uh, um, we see nice regeneration of the infarcted heart. Uh, and you can see here, this is uh, without uh, VEGF, and with VEGF, you can see more blood vessels uh, entering. And if the, if the VEGF, for example, is uh, uh, terminated or uh, uh, used by the cells, we found a way to uh, engineer a system that uh, will be able to reload uh, VEGF or any other factor into the scaffolds you know, just by injecting them to the, uh, in this case, uh, to the tail vein of the uh, animals. So we can simply regenerate the heart and uh, show nice regeneration after uh, one month. However, if we look uh, further, after two months, there is a really nice rejection because these all materials are synthetic. And people thought, well, let's take, uh, uh, for example, pigs' materials, remove all the cells, uh, remove all the DNA. This will not be uh, immunogenic anymore. And uh, we've shown that uh, pigs have different antigens that uh, we don't, do not have in, their, uh, in the ECM, for example, this alpha-gal protein. And this will surely trigger an immune response. And even with the ECM proteins with, that we do share with the pigs, for example, collagens and uh, sugars or other uh, uh, molecules, there's a different uh, sequence. For example, collagen uh, 
for 37 uh, uh, percent uh, uh, difference, and this surely triggers an immune response. Uh, and these all people that, uh, the, the people that get these uh, biomaterials these days, there are millions of people that get immunosuppressors, so they will not die of heart attack, but perhaps from uh, flu. Um, so what we decided to do was to rely on the patient's own materials as well, on the patient's own cells, so we can take fatty tissue from the patient, remove the cells, reprogram them to become induced pluripotent stem cells, and then differentiate to whatever we want. And uh, from this uh, biomaterial, the collagenous material, uh, we can create a scaffold, then in, uh, put the cells together and create completely autologous uh, patches. Now, if we look at the immune response to uh, these materials, we first uh, simulated the immune response in a dish, human immune response in a dish. I'm not going uh, uh, into all the details, but uh, we were able to show that there is a huge difference, a significant difference between the pig's matrix and the uh, uh, human matrices, and in addition, uh, each donor or each uh, uh, human reacts differently to different uh, uh, biomaterials, different sources of biomaterials, meaning that there is a need for autologous biomaterials to uh, have the best uh, uh, outcome. We did it also in uh, animals, and as you can see, the autologous materials, uh, uh, um, we have less uh, immune response. So if we take cardiac patches and uh, uh, transplant them, this is how uh, it looks like. You can see here two things. One uh, is that uh, usually these days there's an uh, open chest surgery needed, uh, as you can see here. And the second thing, uh, which we will uh, uh, go into it later on, there are stitches to secure the patches to the uh, infarcted heart. So first to uh, address the problem of uh, open chest surgery, to introduce the patches, we decided that we want to take the uh, page, uh, patient's own materials and uh, process it to have a liquid material in room temperature, and in 37 degrees we, uh, it solidifies, so now we can bring this material uh, after mixing it with the cells directly to the heart or any other organ, and then it, uh, uh, it forms the tissue. So what can we do with this technology? As I mentioned, we take the fatty tissue, the stromal cells are reprogrammed to become induced pluripotent stem cells. The ECM uh, is processed to become a personalized hydrogel. We mix everything together, and then in the lab we can create any type of tissue that we want. These are just a partial uh, list. So adipogenic implants for uh, uh, reconstructive uh, surgeries, uh, motor uh, neuron uh, implants for uh, um, spinal cord injury, cortical neurons for Parkinson or brain trauma, uh, cardiovascular for uh, uh, cardiovascular diseases. And we can also use more advanced technologies such as uh, 3D printing or microfluidics to create more complicated or more complex uh, tissues. So to show you what we've done, we, we went to small animals and then we went to uh, big animals. Uh, this is, these are pigs, so we inject the material with cells to the uh, pigs' uh, hearts, directly to the heart, and we see nicer generation of the infarcted uh, heart in pigs. And then if we want to go and 3D print uh, a patch with all the blood vessels, we can look at the patient's CT, look at the blood vessels, transform these blood vessels to the computer, add more blood vessels according to a mathematical modeling to see uh, uh, oxygen transfer. And then we go to a 3D printer that we have in the lab and we can uh, create patient-specific tissues uh, from the patient-specific materials and uh, patient-specific uh, cells, uh, uh, cardiomyocytes, endothelial cells. So we create these uh, tissues that uh, not only match the biochemical content, but also uh, match the uh, anatomical content of, or the uh, anatomy of the heart. So this is just uh, one blood vessel within this uh, cardiac patch. And we've already uh, started uh, playing with uh, actually uh, printing whole hearts. This is, uh, well, it's a speed-up movie. Uh, but it takes four hours to uh, print uh, these uh, uh, rabbit-sized uh, hearts from human cells and human uh, uh, materials, and you can see the blood vessels. Um, and the next thing would be to culture these uh, hearts for a long period of time to mature the cells so it would have uh, contracting uh, ability. This is how it looks uh, um, in the middle of uh, printing. You can see the uh, vessels and everything, and at the end, 
uh, when we injected the dyes, blue dyes and uh, red dyes, you can see the septum in between. Um, so uh, it's an advanced uh, project. Um, sometimes we don't need to um, uh, engineer a whole tissue and uh, transplant a whole tissue. Sometimes in case of uh, Parkinson, for example, or the retina, we just need to uh, introduce cells. But cells, as I mentioned, if we just uh, inject them, they simply die. So we need to encapsulate them uh, in small uh, droplets. And for that, we use uh, microfluidics. We inject the patient's own materials with the cells here. Here we inject the uh, oil, so we create tiny emulsions. And then we can uh, uh, collect this uh, droplet with cells, uh, heat them up to 37 degrees, collect them. And as you can see here, these are uh, uh, dopaminergic uh, neurons that uh, later on were uh, uh, injected to uh, the brain. This is a different story. Um, Another problem that we have in the heart is the transfer of the electrical signal. The biomaterials that we use uh, don't really allow nice transfer of the electrical signal. So we have cells here and cells here, a biomaterial in between. These contract and these contract, but they're not really speaking with each other on the electrical level. And we decided that we want to uh, incorporate gold nanowires uh, into these biomaterials so now the cells can interact with each other. And in a series of uh, uh, papers, we've shown first that without gold nanowires, there's no really synchronous uh, contraction. But once we introduce these uh, uh, particles, everything, I hope that you can see it, everything is contracting uh, together. We already taken the patient's own materials and uh, uh, incorporated gold nanoparticles for that. And here you can see that this is a really uh, natural material, but it is fully conducting without losing all the biological motifs uh, that it has. And we, we, we did it with different types of uh, uh, neurons as well, uh, dopaminergic and, uh, and uh, other uh, neurons, spinal cord. And gold nanoparticles have uh, uh, different uh, um, physical properties that we can also exploit for other things. If you remember the two stitches that uh, were uh, done on the heart to secure the patch, here we wanted to uh, use the, uh, uh, these uh, physical properties of uh, gold nanorods to allow suture-free uh, um, um, uh, placement of the patch to the heart. So if we uh, use near IR and illuminate these uh, uh, particles, what they do, they exchange the uh, energy, they uh, transfer it to uh, uh, thermal energy, which simply solder the uh, patch to the heart without harming the tissue. And this is how it looks uh, on the heart with the 30 seconds of illumination with the near IR, which is uh, safe to the body. And this is how it looks with uh, uh, an SCM. You can see here the heart and the cardiac patch without sutures that will uh, uh, harm the tissue. The last uh, series of uh, one project, but uh, uh, some uh, uh, um, some work that was done was uh, how to create cyborg tissues. Uh, and this is the uh, incorporation of electronics, nanoelectronics with engineered tissues, not just because it's uh, fun and cool to in, uh, uh, integrate electronics with living uh, systems, uh, because there was a need to, uh, um, uh, to sense the function of the tissue at all times. So what we've done here, we created electronics, uh, uh, nanoelectronic, porous electronics, incorporated it with the uh, biomaterials to have uh, 3D scaffolds with many, many nanosensors within. Once we culture cardiac cells, we can immediately see the function on the computer. We can add drugs and see how these drugs affect the, uh, 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 the tissue. Um, it was a really nice project, a nice publication, but it wasn't enough for us because in this case we could only sense the function of the tissue. Uh, we couldn't do, uh, if the tissue was not working properly, we couldn't do anything. So the next thing that uh, we've done was to incorporate, in addition to the recording ability, stimulation ability and release of drugs. So actually uh, we wanted to be able to type on the computer and provide electrical stimulation or release uh, drugs. For example, if we sense that there is not enough uh, oxygen, we can release drugs that uh, um, uh, um, allow us to uh, bring stem cells from the bone marrow to create uh, blood vessels. Or if we sense that there is inflammation, release dexamethasone. And these are not things that I imagine. These are things that we've done here. So if you think about the technology, the patient is sitting in his house, is not feeling well. 
the uh, physician can log on to the computer and decide how he wants to uh, activate it from afar. The next thing was to uh, incorporate many drugs within this uh, uh, electronics so we can decide when and uh, how to or where to release uh, different uh, drugs. In collaboration with uh, John Rogers in uh, Northwestern, uh, he gave us uh, uh, 3D electronics and we incorporated the hydrogels to create the same thing but with real 3D uh, structures. Now if we think about uh, the heart or how to incorporate electronics to the heart, we need to think about uh, uh, many things and some of them is for example, that the heart is uh, a dynamic organ, and when we create these electronics, we use the, uh, the same way that uh, electronics is uh, made by the electronics industry, by lithography. This is something that uh, do not match the mechanical properties of the heart and cannot really uh, work with the heart together, and this leads to immune response and other uh, reactions. So the next thing that uh, uh, we wanted to do is to 3D print really soft electronics together with the tissues and this is what we've done so you can see here that we've formulated uh, uh, some electrodes that are really really uh, soft and together with the uh, uh, patient specific hydrogel uh, we created this uh, uh, electronic patch that the electrodes are already built in by uh, uh, printing and now in this movie you'll be able to see how soft it is And once we want to record, we can record a function of the tissue and we can provide stimulation. Finally, uh, sometimes we don't want the electronics to stay there for a long period of time. We want to be able to remove it. So there are two uh, types of uh, degradable electronics that we're working on at the lab. Uh, the first one uh, I'm going to show you, the first one I will not disclose, but the first one is when we pre uh, design the materials to degrade after a certain amount of time. The second one is uh, that the electronics stays there for a long period of time until we provide the uh, uh, external trigger. Uh, with the uh, uh, pre-designed, we uh, using polymers that we know how long they stay in the body and when they start to degrade. So we create these electronics, we show that they and provides the uh, stimulation and uh, sensing. Then when we transplant them, after three weeks, for example, uh, they simply uh, uh, disappear. And the next project that we work on, next big project, is how to create a whole heart with electronics. And this is just uh, uh, preliminary results where we have uh, this is a CT image of the heart that we engineered with many electronic uh, uh, systems within that can really uh, activate and sense everything and this is uh, uh, made from scratch, meaning we can take the patient's own materials, patient's own cells, incorporate electronics and build whole hearts, whole bionic hearts. And uh, with that I will uh, acknowledge my group members and uh, funding and collaborators and if you have any other questions. Uh, we started working on kidneys with uh, uh, Benny Deckel from Shiba uh, Hospital. We uh, started printing uh, parts of it, not, 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 uh, not the whole kidney, but uh, it's still preliminary, but, uh, but uh, I think, yeah. Well, uh, younger people cells, are, they work uh, better, however there would be an immune response, so you need to uh, give them immunosuppressors, so it's better to take from the patients. But what you do when you induce uh, 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 pluripotent stem cells, you make the cells younger again. So uh, perhaps this, uh, this would be a good uh, thing to do, to take cells from older people and then create young cells. From the uh, well, but uh, for these that are already old, you know, uh, yeah, this is one of the things that we want to do, to take this fatty tissue um, when you're young, uh, store it, and then uh, whenever you want, I haven't shown what we do with spinal cord and uh, Parkinson and other things, but uh, you can have any, some kind of insurance, place it in a, in a refrigerator, and then after one or two months, you can have the tissue that you want.
they, they are functional, they contract, or they do whatever they need to do in terms of the, what, what kind of tissue you want to uh, uh, engineer. And we check for uh, undifferentiated uh, uh, cell markers, and we see that we don't have uh, we don't have them, but still, when we go to the clinic, we'll need to uh, uh, be sure that uh, uh, these cells will not form teratomas later on, but uh, I think we're on the way to do that. Thank you.